our judges and our, our veterans and our military uh, service members that are here today. We very much appreciate you uh, joining us and we look forward to uh, a very great CLE and a, uh, and a nice ceremony later on uh, this afternoon. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jonathan Crest. Uh, Jonathan was very gracious in coming and helping us to put this together as sort of the beginning of our Veterans Day. He's the founder and owner of Crest and Associates a law practice specializing in criminal defense in state, federal, and military courts worldwide. Mr. Chris was a former active duty U.S. Army Judge Advocate and currently holds the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in the Pennsylvania Army National Guard Judge Advocate General Corps. He has personally litigated more than 100 cases to verdict and alternatively resolved numerous others all over the world to include Germany, Kosovo, Iraq, and Japan. Jonathan Crisp has extensive experience in all aspects of criminal practice and is similarly well versed in military justice practice. We're very proud to call Colonel Crisp an alum and appreciate his efforts here. So I'll turn the time now over to him. Thank you, Dean. I uh, appreciate the warm welcome and distinguished uh, guests. I'd like to begin, and that is, you are hopefully all aware. And can everyone hear me well enough in the back? Yes. Okay. So I do tend to wander a little bit, so I apologize. I hope I don't make anybody dizzy here with uh, the fact that I don't like to be stuck in our lecture. But what I want to talk about and what is some of the unique aspects of practice in military force and to a certain extent uh, state and federal courts, but much more applicable for military courts is the ethical challenges that are presented in hierarchies and, and rank structure. So we'll talk about that, and, and we're focusing on Rule 1.1, competence. So competence in, implicates a number of ethical rules of the uh, ethics code. And the first thing we're going to talk about is competence in complex cases. That's what we typically think about when you are litigating a case that Anything even from family law, if you're not an experienced family law practitioner, to knowing how to do a quadro, to doing asbestos litigation. So those are the types of things you're talking about there, and, and making sure that when you take on a case of that nature, that you actually know what you're doing and how to zealously litigate those types of things. And then the second component that we're going to talk about is zealously prosecuting or defending high-level cases. This is where we're going to focus predominantly on uh, cases with a military nexus or cases involving military uh, rank structure. It does happen on occasion when you're talking, you know, when you recall, you've got chemist or special appointed prosecutors in cases involving uh, high level government individuals, but where you most commonly see the difficulties inherent in either prosecuting or defending high level type cases is in a military rank structure. And then, of course, you have competence in ever changing technology. We're going to talk a little bit about email metadata, uh, social media, areas that to many of you are, are probably you're very conversant with. Uh, me, I don't have a Facebook account, I have no desire to have one, and uh, probably never will. My firm does, but that's about it. So, um, so 1.1. The PA Rules of Professional Conduct Rule 1.1 <coughs> is a mirror image or the Army Regulation AR 2726 1.1 are mirror images of each other. The rules generally in most service courts have their own individual ethical rules and they generally model after the ABA code. So what we're talking about is the lawyers going to provide a competent representation to a client which requires the legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation necessary for the representation. Now, there's a number of comment sections as you get into this. But I try to maintain sort of a military nexus to 
all of the examples that we're going to give. Now, I'll speak loosely to this if you can't read it. Imagine for a moment you are a brand new lieutenant in the U.S. Army Jack. Now, by way of background, how the Army indoctrinates their new JAG attorneys is you get, now you go through a basic officer leadership course, which is basically the same type of course that an infantry officer, an armor officer goes through. Um, back in the day when I went through, it was three weeks of Army 101. How to do drill and ceremony, uh, which end of the rifle was up, who to salute, you know, do you salute a first sergeant or do you salute a sergeant major, basic, Ooh, just enough so that when you got to your installation, you were terrified you were going to get called out for doing something wrong. So, you go to a three-week course, then you go to a 10-week, 11-week course at the Army JAG School, where you are taught in sort of a fire hose approach, legal assistance, which is uh, wills and trusts, um, basic contract issues, um, Eric, help me out. You probably remember better than I do. I know. Um, think of it as, as general practitioner work that does not implicate criminal defense. So anything where a, a person is going to come in and say, "I have a landlord to tenant, tenant dispute, dispute. I, you know, my girlfriend wants to go after me because I have a case like this where I promised to marry her and she won't give the ring back, and I want the ring back, and I had to do a very unique research on promises to marry and." and how California law treats that. So anything that kind of walks in the door. So most times soldiers are going to come in and say, I'm um, in debt up to my ears, what do I do? And you're helping them with their, those types of things. So that's legal assistance. And you have military administrative law. Uh, the law of the installation, so to speak. Are you allowed to give a ride? Um, to the commanding general wants to know, can I let my wife use the government vehicle to perform certain services in the community? Um, things that involve the installation that can get the command in trouble. Um, we want to do searches coming into the installation for certain types of contraband. How do we do that? What are the policies in place? And then, of course, a fair amount is focused on military justice, and that has gotten quite a bit of attention. Uh, most recently, obviously, with uh, sexual assault cases. And then you're going to have some contract and fiscal law, which is implicated significantly and has gotten a lot of commanders in trouble for overseas deployments or uh, committing funds that were not appropriate for spending money in the wrong way. Uh, what we like to call the color of money is that money spent in the proper way and obligated and committed in the appropriate fashion without committing an anti-deficiency act violation. So you get 11 weeks of that and then you're sent to your first duty station. So let's pretend you're sent overseas, you're showing up for the first time, you're wanting to impress, you're excited, you're in a foreign country, and your boss, Major Jones, says, Lieutenant, I want you to develop, because of where we're stationed, a complex rules and estate plan. So you happen to be in an installation that has a lot of senior level officers and senior level civilians. And it surprised me you know that a lot of individuals accumulated assets in excess of three, four, five million dollars. So you're drafting wills for these types of individuals in theory. So you don't know enough to say you're not a chance in hell. And you go, Roger, sir, that sounds great. Where do I start? So as you get into this, you start to realize how complicated this stuff can be. So Having practiced, let's say, for example, this individual practice maybe as a public defender for a year, which is a public defender, I can tell you that you don't ever touch both of states. What do you do? Do you go back to your boss and go, sir, I don't know what the heck I'm supposed to do, I don't know how I'm supposed to do this. And let's just say your boss is the Army has this great new program that makes it idiot proof. And you go, okay, I got it. But quickly realize that the program is not idiot proof and that you were a fool for saying yes, but you're not knowing how. So the best way to handle this when you are put into a situation where you don't feel like you can get out of this, because I think we would all agree that enough malpractice has been committed when drawing up a complex estate plan that involves a qualified 
uh, terminal interest property trust or other types of complex trusts, and what do you do? So in this case, I sought out the advice of a senior legal assistant attorney, uh, an individual by the name of uh, John Martinson, who was incredibly helpful and incredibly knowledgeable, and taught me how to say no, how to say no in a way, or how to put in guidelines in a way <coughs> that is not it met both the needs of my man and my bar license. Because that's really what we were talking about here at the end of the day. So, as the comments to 1.1 talk, you don't necessarily have to walk into a situation knowing everything about the area that you're going to practice in. But, you also want to make sure that if you do start to do this stuff, you know where your boundaries are, you know what you can do, and you know when to say, this is clearly beyond my capabilities. You're going to need to associate with, or I wouldn't need to associate with, you're gonna to need to retain the services of a qualified uh, estate practitioner. So you can get them to a certain point through the necessary study or consultation with a lawyer, in this case, the senior civilian attorney who did have knowledge in this area, and who was willing to say, you need to step back from this. You're treading too closely to a line. And then, if you want to continue to do this, you instruct them on how to retain the services of a competent estate planner, and you work with that estate planner. And that's how you do it, in that instance. So, that is 1.1 in complex cases. Now, I also would like to take a moment here. Uh, in my firm, we have a number of attorneys that I was recently blessed to be able to work with uh, Davis Younce, who is in the audience here. And uh, Davis is a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army, you know, sorry, U.S. Air Force Reserves. Uh, I met Davis in the uh, Pennsylvania National Guard, and he and I do quite a bit of cases together on the uh, military justice side and uh, some state court work. Um, and talking about the CLE, one of the things we discussed, there were two cases I wanted to talk about in the other way. <coughs> What are the, it's the next component of the lecture, prosecuting and defending high-profile cases in the military. So Davis is very familiar with this particular case. It is a Air Force <coughs> case, and I would like to take a moment to bring him up to talk about that aspect of the case. Thank you. 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 And there's a couple of interesting issues that came up in this case and had to be addressed by the attorneys involved in it. But I have to give a little bit of background about how we got even to the Murphy case in the first place. If you follow the Air Force JAG Corps at all, you know we had some high level issues from 2004 to 2006. The senior attorney in the Air Force JAG Corps is called the TJAC, the Judge Advocate General. And General Fiscus was removed from his position, resigned, and given essentially administrative punishment for. Um, having uh, non-consensual sexual relations with about 15 or 16 subordinates over about a 10 year period. And there were allegations that he obstructed justice, lied about it, and did a whole lot of other things in keeping with them. The result for him was what was called non-judicial punishment, essentially administrative action and resignation or removal from his position. And rather than retiring as a three-star general, he retired as a colonel, now colonel business. Two years later, uh, an individual by the name of Colonel Murphy was a rising star in the Air Force Jack. Loved by everyone, and he was up for promotion to uh, the third position, third highest position in the Air Force Jack Corps, and the promotion to general officer. Now, all general officers are vetted in Congress now. They're vetted through the Senate. And as Colonel Murphy was going through the vetting process, he began to realize, wow, this guy's been done excellent in everything he's done for the Air Force. He worked at the White House. He did a phenomenal job at the White House as a Jack. The problem is, for Colonel Murphy, he had not had a license to practice law since he was a first lieutenant because he had been disbarred by the state of Texas. Now, the part of what happened in this case and why it became so complex was because he didn't lie to the Air Force when he joined the Air Force. He had a valid license to practice law at the time that he joined the United States Air Force JAG Corps, but then he was disbarred suspended and then he was disbarred. So there was no process within the Air Force JAG Corps for verifying or 
repeatedly throughout someone's career that they actually had a current license practice. It was sort of a self-reporting with no processes in step to verify. But one of the things that happened was the defense attorneys defending this case, defending Colonel Murphy, um, there were a lot of concerns that came up. And some of the things that were happening is there were a lot of charges that were being thrown at Colonel Murphy that showed that other people in leadership positions were potentially trying to cover things up and cover up for their own failures to properly supervise him, to properly follow up, and to assure things that should have been known that were public knowledge on the Texas Bar Association website that he had been suspended at his bar in doing those things. So one of the things, in order to be competent, in order to have all the information and go through this, defense attorneys had to do, file a lot of motions that deal with high level things. One of the issues that came up in the case was he was White House counsel. And in the military, one of the things that you do is you talk about someone's military career for sentencing purposes. A big part of sentencing purposes. What have they done in the military? Are they a war hero? Have they, have they served in combat? What have they done? The problem was, essentially everything he'd done at the White House was either classified or the White House counsel's office asserted, asserted executive privilege. So none of it was able to be released to the defense. So the defense counsel filed motions, and ultimately the judge in that case ruled and was was it was upheld on appeal that there, the only punishment that the court martial was allowed to give Colonel Murphy if he was convicted of any offenses was no punishment because the White House's failure to release this information inherently interfered with his due process rights to have a fair sentencing in the mitigation case. If they weren't going to release it, the government was going to choose not to release it. The only sanction he could receive was no punishment. Okay. Brings up a whole lot of issues about confidence and how you address those issues. But even before you got there, there were a lot of questions. Why is Colonel Murphy being court-martialed when General Fiscus obstructed justice and did other things and was not court-martialed? When this case started, Colonel Murphy was facing over 41 years in a military confinement facility for his charges, whereas General Fiscus was facing administrative sanctions. So in the military, a common motion that come up is, is related to unlawful command influence, meaning a senior person is unlawfully exerting control on the process, tipping the scale, if you will, and also selective prosecution, that leadership for some reason is, is choosing to interfere with someone's rights by prosecuting someone or treating someone differently than a similar situated person. So in the process of preparing for this case, one of the things that the defense counsel had to do in order to be competent is go very, very high level to the White House, to the White House counsel's office to file these motions, to interview and even cross-examine in motions practice high-level officials throughout the Pentagon, throughout the Air Force, JAG Corps. And understand that the attorneys doing this were relatively junior attorneys. The lead defense attorney for the case was an Air Force major, which is a mid-level JAG. A mid-level JAG with about eight years' experience practicing. She had to cross-examine on the stand during motions practice the judge, the sitting judge advocate general of the Air Force who had been the prior supervisor of General Murray. I will tell you, it was not a pleasant cross-examination. And there were things that happened during that cross-examination that our JAG Corps lore, such as putting up her hand to cut him off <laughs> during cross-examination when he wasn't answering the question and rambling on, and she did a very effective job as a brilliant advocate. As a, she was truly a brilliant courtroom advocate. She pulled no punches in that case. But I will also tell you, that's what she had to do. In order to be competent, she had to have that information. She had to file it. But that is a unique part of the military justice process that we don't always see in civilian practice when it comes to that. To put it into somewhat civilian context, think of a large law firm, like the Army JAG Corps or the Air Force JAG Corps. Think of a large law firm. Imagine you were asked as a, as a associate, maybe not a junior associate, but a low-level associate, to cross-examine and question the competence, ability, and decision-making of the senior partner of that law firm. And then expect to progress in that law firm. And those, those are the things that you have to deal with. Those are the questions of competency that come up in the military. Now, the military has matured a lot in our military justice process in, in making sure that we still pipe a little bit, chains of command for defense counsel, and things like that. But these are the kind of cases that you see in the military. So when you read in the headlines, imagine, if you will, being the attorneys involved in that and being the defense attorneys having to make these decisions about what to do and how to go about competently prosecuting or defending these cases. Um, I think it's a very interesting and I think Davis, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, shortly after this court martial, I think uh, this major got out, uh, was never 
promoted, but uh, not necessarily saying it's directly related to that. But I think she realized once you get into defending or prosecuting these types of cases, um, it, it changes your viewpoint on the service, not necessarily in a bad way. Uh, and I can speak to this in a few moments about a case that I was involved in that was a, a high profile case that I never envisioned I would ever be a part of. Um, but I want to give a snippet here moving on to my favorite, albeit not necessarily <coughs> The mouse. Thank you. The movie that I like to quote from when talking to clients. probably about six different snippets from that movie I could take to talk about in this case because it did involve going after a rising star in the ring. Um, clearly there's some uh, drama implied or, or used in this movie, but one of the great things that I like about this movie is it, w it was a foreshadowing to uh, some cases and, and what I dealt with when trying to interview general officers who potentially are implicit or complicit in misconduct. So in 2005, I was sitting in my living room watching uh, the news, and this was it. The uh, Iraq war was still uh, ramping up, and I see this interview with a young lady named Lindy on the television, where she's talking about what she was doing at Abu Ghraib and what the United States uh, Special Forces was involved in and some of the other alphabet organizations that were theoretically involved and the interrogations that we utilized and so on and so forth. Now I'm listening to this woman going, one, I cannot believe her attorney let her talk because she's being charged criminally. And two, thinking, thank God I have no affiliation with this case because it just sounds like a, an absolute bloody nightmare. And I turn to my wife and say, I'm just glad I'm not employed right now. Well, lo and behold, the army sent her back to Fort Bragg. And I was stationed very close to Fort Bragg. And in the military, an accused has three rights to counsel. One, the right to detailed counsel that the Army or the Air Force or the Marine Corps or whoever is going to give you an attorney. We're going to give you lieutenant, captain, so-and-so, and you're going to be represented by that individual. You also have the right to what's called individual military counsel, or IMC request. I heard that Lieutenant Colonel Davis Younts is amazing, and I want him to represent him. Or I know him, and I have a personal relationship with him, and I think he would do well represented. 
then you have civilian counsel you can hire. At no expense to the government. So you have three choices. So she had detailed counsel, and at some point she decided to hire her detailed counsel, who was an individual military counsel request. And that's where I came in. At that point, my command had to make the determination am I reasonably available to perform this service, and do I want to do it? And I thought, with a case of this nature, and this opportunity, it would be cool not to do it, but I also recognize intuitively that this is going to involve things at a level that I just had no knowledge or experience or competence in as a junior captain. I was actually a second tour captain, so I wasn't quite junior, but as Davis noted, I was still very early on in my career. I had been in the Army for five years. So I looked at this case as an opportunity from a career standpoint that I couldn't walk away from, but I recognize that I'm going to be doing things and involving myself with senior level officers in a way that I had not ever done. So just if you recall, what Abu Ghraib dealt with was there were images, videos, soldiers torturing or doing things to prisoners in the prison that ultimately became public. And Lindy was the poster child for that. So there was her standing on a box. I'm sorry, her. There was one of the soldiers standing on a box with a black hood on. There were guys with theoretical electrodes attached to them. All these images come out about what the U.S. Army is doing to Iraqi prisoners, which served as a great intelligence tool for the opposition at the end of the day. So my job was to figure out what happened and why. So at one point in time, I ended up bringing on another captain to work with me, who I had a great deal of respect for. And she had worked at another installation and was very well liked by her commanding general. And he turned to her and said, now that you're going to work on this case, you're going to get to see at a very early point in your career how Big Army works. And she relayed that to me. I kind of had an idea what he meant. And she kind of did, but we really didn't know. And what ultimately I was able to determine through this process is, in working with the other defense counsel and the other attorneys who were involved in this case, is that in order to effectively defend, much like the major in that current working case, you have to be willing to assume some risk in your career. You have to be willing to push back. Because let's be honest, the Army had every reason to want to quickly dispose of this case in a way that involved the least level of publicity. And early on, there were allegations that Donald Rumsfeld had knowledge about what was going on, that Wolfowitz was involved, and so on and so forth. And what really caused these guys to engage in a lot of the activities that they engaged in? Now, without getting into the weeds too much in terms of why this happened and what happened, we were forced to call probably five to six general officers up to the three-star level. And imagine you're talking about, I'm a captain, which is a 03, so you're talking about major, lieutenant colonel, seven levels above me. You know, normally as a captain, I'm never going to talk to a general, maybe a one-star at some point in time, but a three-star, that's going to be Colonel Perot. And I'm going to gladly hand over the reins and say, sir, here's what you need to tell, you know, here's what you need to read. And I'm going to walk away from it because I'm just not going to be in that environment. But here we are trying to depose three-star generals and ask them, what did you say? What was your intent in how these detainees were going to be interrogated? What guidance was given? What briefings? Because remember, at this point in time, what was the primary issue? What was the Bush White House concerned with? What was actionable intelligence? What actionable intelligence led us to engage in the invasion? That's what they wanted to know. And as it came out, the gloves were off. That was one of the key phrases. The gloves are off, do what you got to do, get what you got to get, and so on. And then how was my client involved in this at an incredibly low level? She was a private. So you don't really get much lower than that in this scenario. So what's supposed to happen is that you're going to be working, military intelligence assets are going to be working in tandem with other assets in the Army. So they're going to develop interrogation tactics and techniques that are compliant with the laws of war. And you're going to have a JAG involved in that process. So one of my questions was to go talk to the JAG who was stationed at that prison 
and then find out who his boss was. You know, the boss of uh, an installation from a legal standpoint is what's called a staff judge advocate. So every military installation has a staff judge advocate. Fort Jackson does, Fort Bragg does, and so on. It's usually a colonel or a lieutenant colonel, depending upon the size of the installation. So that JAG at the prison is going to take his guidance from the staff judge advocate. So what do you do? What, you know, how, how involved do you want me to be? And a lot of this information that was coming out was based on my investigation, something that the staff judge advocate was aware of. So I went to my boss, who was the regional defense counsel at the time, the position that I currently hold in the guard, and I said, sir, you work for this colonel. Can you tell me a little bit about him? So I want to call him up, I want to depose him, I want to talk to him and find out what his role was in this. So my boss at the time I had a great deal of respect for um, told me a little bit about it, wanted to know why, and was very uh, curious to, to say. And after about 10 minutes, I ended the conversation a little uncomfortable because of how he questioned me and what he wanted to know and so on. And I, obviously I'm not going to be disclosing client confidences, I'm not going to talk about specifics necessarily. So the next day, unbeknownst to me, an email goes out from this boss talking about how there are questions. And it went to all of my colleagues in this region, all the defense counsel. How trial defense service is set up is you have the head of trial defense service in <coughs> and then you have regions that the lieutenant colonels would supervise. I happen to be in the southeast region at the time. So all of my fellow defense counsel and senior defense counsel who report to this colonel got an email, except for me. There have been questions about this colonel. I served under this colonel. He was a brilliant boss. If anyone questions his competence, I want you to come and talk to me before anything is said or done because of what I think of this individual, because how great I think he is, and so on and so forth. Now, I didn't hear about this until a friend of mine called me and said, hey, did you see that email? And I said, what are you talking about? And he says, well, did you know, you know, I don't know what prompted it, but it was just weird. It came out of the blue. And I said, Bill, you got to be kidding me. I know what prompted this. And I began to talk to him about the conversation I had. And I said, so what do I do? Because what that email basically told me is, tread lightly when it comes to talking to senior level officers and potentially smearing a senior level officer without a good faith basis. Now, that was never the part of my, that was never, was never done but it was, I need to find out what I don't know. And if I find out what I need to know to defend my client, I'm gonna do what I gotta do. I don't care who it is. But it made me really quickly aware that even at the 06 kernel level, that this could be a challenging case because this was pretty early on. So all that did really was sort of take me off and make me say I wanna do this even more because it felt like, you know, here I am representing this poor little private who the army is easily gonna run over if they want. And then there's me and my co-counsel. So it sort of felt like the most awesome David and Goliath scenario you can imagine. But um, that and a number of other situations arose during the course of the trial that was truly an amazing experience in terms of what I was able to do in the Army. And I will tell you um, that but for that experience, I, I, I think I would have a very different perspective on things. But it, it would be made me grow up and say, okay, the Army is, is a lot like, is any, just like any other human organization, that at times is going to protect their own, but at times goes to great lengths to protect even privates and so on. I can tell you this, at no point was I ever denied the opportunity to defend or find the funds to defend her. Um, you know, travel requests were granted liberally and, and so on. So it wasn't as if the deck was stacked against me intentionally. I think what people did not realize was and I don't know how nefarious his intent was, but I think it sends the wrong message, and I think it is a good teaching point to say, are we really capable of pushing back in those circumstances where we need to push back? Do we have the intestinal fortitude to say, hey, I don't care what effect this is gonna have. I'm gonna do this because it's the right thing, because that's what she needs. So. Question? 
Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that there, there are three, three rights to uh, military personnel as to counsel, uh, detail, individual military, civilian. Are they ever entitled to a combination from among those three? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Just because you have detailed counsel doesn't mean, you, and I routinely, when I do this as a civilian now, I will routinely keep the local counsel on. Um, having served as a public defender, having served as or essentially a public defender in the Army as a trial defense attorney, and as a uh, defense counsel, senior defense counsel, now regional defense counsel, clients always ask me, why should I hire a civilian? And there are some attorneys who are going to say, well, because the trial defense counsel are terrible. No. I've worked under amazing, my first boss in the public defender's office, she was amazing. I learned a tremendous amount from her. And the same holds true for GDS. So you're going to get really very competent attorneys. You're going to get once in a while a band, you know, just like you get in the civilian sector. So the only times I have ever, the only time <coughs> I think I've released my military counsel because I thought he truly was working at odds with what I was trying to accomplish. It's rare that that happens, but it does. Um, but you want that local counsel there because sometimes, in the course of a trial, you want someone in a uniform to ask a question of a particular witness. Sometimes they're local and then they can, hey, I need you to go right over and interview this guy because I'm here in Harrisburg, you're in Germany, and it's a heck of a lot easier for you to go grab Private Snuffy over there and talk to him about this. So it is routine that they work together. Um, and, some, and, and certain civilian counsel are better at it than others in terms of utilizing the strengths and weaknesses of their uh, military defense counsel, but now you're allowed to have both. Even in the IMC, environment, you're still allowed to have the detail. You can have one counsel and say, but I'd also like this guy over here. And depending upon the level of the case, you know, a Bergdahl case, for example, you're going to get you know, any high-level cases or any complex case. Let's say it's a, a, a very dense classified information file or a case that involves um, classified information. You may need to have a senior attorney appointed who's much more experienced in dealing with gray mail matters than you might be in like that. So it happens quickly. Thank you. And by the way, any questions that come up during the course of the uh, lecture, just please raise your hand and jump in. I'm uh, happy to do that. So, John, yes, sir. What role does the U.S. attorney or the actual then criminal aspect of non military then get involved in these cases? And how do you kind of keep them out of it, keep the clients safe? Okay, keeping them, you represent them in the military tribunal. What about facts that come out where the U.S. attorney says, I want to step in, or an attorney general from a particular state wants to step in? How, how do you, how do you okay, advise your client? Dealing, right, dealing with the U.S. attorney's office, we'll, we'll take them, there's two, really two questions here. You still have, you have federal jurisdiction. So whether it's federal military or federal government, it's still, in that case, you're not going to have multiple prosecutions. You can have a court martial and a state court prosecution because it's a separate sovereign concept. Rarely have I seen the feds ever get involved in a court martial process. Normally they're just going to defer and say, hey, we've got enough of a caseload, you take it. You know, in this case, it happened overseas. The federal government at the time did not have any jurisdiction over them, nor would they have reason for Title 10 under which service members serve is worldwide. No matter where you are, what you're doing, we have it. So in this particular instance, actually what the Iraq War has taught us uh, and, and Precipitated legislation called well, the Military Extra Jurisdictional Act of Egypt. Contractors overseas. We all heard about misconduct from contractors overseas. Well, the Iraqi government, we didn't have a status of forces agreement with them. So, what do we do? There was no government, really. How do we prosecute those contractors that engaged in rape, that engaged in theft when they're sitting in Iraq and we have no way to get in touch with them now? And in my case, actually, what it involved was um, that we had a lot of translators. And I was amazed at how many translators engaged in misconduct, um, whether it's rape of local nationals or just abuse in this prison. Because we bring them in, we need to have, I mean, when I went over there, I had to have probably half a dozen different translators. Someone speaks Farsi, someone speaks Arabic, you know. Um, so I needed someone to translate at various points in time. Well, these guys were contractors that were brought in from different countries who oftentimes did speak stuff. So what do we do? But, so that's where, it, it's rare that that happens. The only time I've seen the federal government step into a, a military prosecution is if the misconduct either predated the person's 
time in the military or continue to cast that. So for example, I just had a case in the Navy, which was a child pornography case where the uh, seaman joined in, let's say, just one January of 2015. And during the course of his um, media, ex his uh, internet exploits, NCIS found uh, he was sending images to 15, 14 year old girls, and one of the parents turned them into the NCIS agent on the installation. He seized his media, did a search, uh, charged him in the Navy, but then when he did a detailed search of his hard drive, they realized this guy's been doing this well prior to his enlistment in the Navy, and there were six other victims that they wanted to go after. So then they turned that over to the U.S. Attorney's Office. So that became a DOJ, or DO, a DOJ case. So normally, because of that, you're not going to see it. Now, the other time I've ever seen the state step in after a prosecution is if it's unsuccessful. So let's say the military takes primary jurisdiction, and normally that's what happens. The state doesn't really want to do anything. They say, you know what, they're going to get their pound of flesh in the military. We don't care. So what you see is when you have a murder trial, for example, there's been a couple of these over the years that have happened, where they're acquitted in either state court the military says I'm going to let state court try it, or vice versa. As a case that happened in, in North Carolina, he was tried in North Carolina State Court. Uh, he was acquitted there. Um, literally one week after the transcripts were done, they take the transcripts to the trial counsel, which is the prosecutor in the military, Mark Bragg, and say, we lost, you have a hack at it. And they did the military successfully prosecuted him, he was convicted, and he's now serving a life sentence at one level. So you don't necessarily get to control that, um, in it, but it, it is rare that that happens. So then without getting into it. Yes, ma'am. I just want to go back to the first case that you spoke about for a second. Did you say that the three-star gentleman was, some of the claims against him was for non-consensual non sex? Did you say non-consensual? Correct. So he raped people and the best he got was the moment? There was the allegation that he had, yes. And well, was it proven? I mean, they didn't, they didn't prosecute him, so I'm not going to say it was proven. Uh, but there, there were victims who came forth and said he sexually assaulted him. So. So it was settled. It was, it was, it was. Okay. Right. I thought he was found guilty, and that's what he got. That's no, in the colonel, in, in that case, uh, in, the, in the Fiscus case, again, not Colonel Murphy, but in the Fiscus case, which predated Colonel Murphy in the Air Force. He was able to successfully negotiate an exit out of the Air Force without any kind of prosecution. So when we talk about an administrative action or a non-judicial action, it's a punishment that does not involve the criminal conviction. So the military can take rank, take money, uh, <coughs> without necessarily getting a criminal conviction. The only way you get a conviction is if you are court-martialed in the military. And those victims have no recourse to the non-military that's not exactly true. Um, there are, you should have stepped in a lot outside of my current zone in terms of this stuff, but now I can say there's legislation that does give, there's a tremendous uh, victim compensation uh, vehicles in place now, and I, and I would not, Ferry's doctrine is pretty tough, because it depends on what's, what their status was, and most of these were military. So, um, it would have been very difficult for, that, for them to recover because of the very far. But uh, nowadays, that hasn't been addressed. So. Sir? One example of this is, Major, obviously, sitting in the room here, is the Regional Special Victim, Victims Council for the National Guard. So the military has now created what's called a Special Victims Council program. So if you are, if you allege that you are a victim of sexual assault in the military and some other crimes like domestic violence, the military will provide at no cost to you your own victims council to ensure that you have all the protections and advice. If you want to sue the military, sue someone else, you're going to have to go outside of that. But uh, Major obviously is an example of, of that program. So excellent program. And that raises a very good point, thank you. Um, so what happens now is uh, an individual comes forward and says, I have been a victim of sexual assault, and um, you know, this is what happened. Immediately that person is given a counsel, an attorney who's going to advocate for them, because let's face it, there are times when the prosecution, their approach may not always align with the interest of the victim. And that happens sometimes. 
So Major Augustine is going to come in and say, okay, prosecutor, I know you want to do this, this, and this, but my client wants this. And my client wants, doesn't want to have to go through this process and get to post 16 different times. And if it does happen, I'm going to be right there. So now we have a third attorney in the courtroom. So as a defense attorney, I hate him <laughs> because now I can't talk to these victims. But it's a very effective advocate for the victim in this process. All right, switching gears here a little bit. If I can. In a much more scintillating area. Technology. <laughs> so, this is what we typically think of, I think, when we're looking at competence, you know, either in the first instance or now in the, the latter instance. So, most of you are going to be familiar with a lot of the issues that can come up, but it's always fun to kind of go up with different scenarios that can arise in the technological arena. So, what we're talking about is how is your utilization of technology going to get you in trouble? So I remember when I first was suggested to me to start going on with people, people's Facebook pages, victims, and start getting information about that. I don't have to get a website, I have to get a Facebook account. So I decided not to use mine, but maybe one of my staff members, so I didn't have to do that. I despise the idea of it. But at the end of the day, it is a trove of information. And this may come as a shock to some of you, but your clients, the defendants, actually put dumb stuff on Facebook. <laughs> and the prosecutor loves Facebook. So I'm going to kind of go out of order here and jump down to this area here. Client social media, because this is the most fun area. We've all heard the scenario, the client comes in your office, dumbing it down to keep it simple and short, because we're running out of time. I killed somebody, here's the gun, take it. We all know we don't touch the gun, we don't do anything with the gun, I'm sorry, I can't do this. Well, now in the 21st century, we have the social media equivalent. I have a Facebook page, because I'm going to ask them. Do you have a Facebook? Yes, I do. What's on there? Oh, I was talking about how I beat the living hell out of this guy. Great. Well, uh, okay. So who says delete it? Get rid of it right now. Who tells them to do that? Which is the equivalent of saying, take that gun, throw it in the river, which we know we can't do. So what we can say is, just what we're going to say when they come to us with evidence. I cannot advise you to destroy evidence. I cannot advise you to get rid of this. And I can't take it. And depending on the questions that are asked in the follow-up scenario, you're going to say, you may not destroy this evidence. But what I'm going to say in the social media context is, you can put restrictions on who sees your social media. And you can put uh, privacy settings on there. You can <laughs> shut down your Facebook account if you so choose. Well, can I get rid of that stuff? No. Well, what happens when they, well, can they go find it? Can they look for it? Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe there's some nuance I'm not seeing, but how is that advice not destructive when others access to evidence? Shut down your Facebook. Don't remove the post. Just shut it down. Because there's still evidence, it still exists. In some way, you can still obtain access to it. Is the gun in the river? It still exists. No, but, you, but in a in a criminal context, there's still going to be a subpoena of those records. You're not you're not trying to remove evidence and delete it forever. Shutting it down means there's still an account potentially there that Facebook and a subpoena will be able to respond to. And they do. Facebook. Sure. In a civil context, you still have to answer questions and respond to the request for production of documents in that scenario as well. So there's a difference between delete, i.e. destroy, versus change privacy settings, you can close your account, because you can always go back in and open your account back up again. It's not gone when you close it. When you delete it, you're not going to get that back unless if there's metadata somewhere on the server of Facebook. That's much more, that's much different. That's as far as you can go. And 
I know this is actually a very interesting area in, in terms of discoveries and things like this. So, any other questions with respect to that? So, that's what the Philadelphia Bar Association opinion is. Can the advisor social media accounts?
uh, civilian employer email account, set up a Gmail account through a third party, and so on and so forth. So even when I send a fee agreement electronically, I never send it to any place, and I tell them never even open up or go home. Do it this way. So that's the, the, the quick down and dirty I want you to get for the email piece. Metadata. Um, here you're generally talking about ghost images from documents that you're creating and recreating and redrafting that if your opposing counsel is smart, they can access and you're, you're going to potentially disclose other client sensitive information that you would not otherwise have wanted to disclose. So uh, it's, it's not as much of a problem as it used to be, but making sure that you are uh, re not just cutting and pasting in documents is very important here. And that's the quick takeaway from the metadata. The other piece of the social media. Yes. And can you give a couple of specific example or two of how the issue of the metadata um, happened or how it not my practice necessarily, and I can't say it, it's, it's not been an issue here, but what, what you have seen in the past is you take a document that may have um, information from a former client in there, okay, you're storing it and you know, it's created for the uh, crisp counts litigation, okay, so his lawyer creates this document and it has all this, you know, and, and you'll see a lot of times information at the bottom of it or when you go into the properties of a document and it talks about discovery, uh, communications between certain third parties or whatever, and then you reuse that exact same document, but the property still possess elements of that earlier created document. Okay, I get that. Um, isn't it correct, though, that if you take that document and convert it to a Adobe and all that, then they're not available? Yes, and a good point. I'm sorry I did not bring it up. Thank you. So, this one, you know, no, that's correct. That, that will, from a Word document, that will change that. So oftentimes you would sometimes get people sending Word documents with, you know, creating their original sign or whatever that wasn't PDF, and then you open it up and you're like, oh, wow, check this out. So, yes, and that's, that's correct. So, yes, that's, that's the teaching point, which you brought that up. All right, um, I want to go and find out and talk to a victim. And I'm going to friend her on Facebook. And I want to say, hey, what's going on? And I want to talk to her and find out what she said about my client and whether or not she's saying this was regret from the next morning or whether or not she truly was raped. But I didn't tell her who I am. Are we OK? No, I think we can all agree that that's actually she problem. So we still have a duty of candor to any time you interview an individual, you have to tell them who you are, you have to say what your role in the litigation is, and you have to advise them. You don't have to talk to me. You absolutely don't. And I'm still amazed at how, many, how often people still say, okay, I still want to talk to you. But as long as you clearly tell them who you are, you clearly tell them you don't, they don't have to talk to you. Would you like to talk to me or would you mind if I did? They nine times out of ten will say yes. Unless Major Augustine has said you don't talk to Chris. So and this is what we're we're done. So there are uh, our opinions on all of these issues. Um, that if anyone wants to take a look at them, you're welcome. So thank you all very much.